Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second uh, Philosophy and Theology Department Lecture Series Lecture of the 2012-2013 academic year. Uh, this week, we have Sister Jacinta Krejcik speaking on the people of God, revisiting Lumen Gentium, a very appropriate topic and a very appropriate week. Just on Thursday, the year of faith began. Bishop Rhodes celebrated Mass at the cathedral, and we marked both the <clears throat> feast of Blessed John the 23rd and the 50th anniversary of the convocation and opening of the Second Vatican Council. So we're very happy to have Sister Jacinta here today, perhaps the holiest member of our department, might I say, and uh, certainly the most beloved in my opinion. <laughs> Sister Jacinta has a master's in pastoral studies from Loyola University Chicago, 2002. She also has her master of arts in theology from University of Notre Dame in 2007. Is this your fifth year at the University of St. Francis? Uh, yes. She's in her fifth year in our department. She teaches prayer and worship, introduction to the Bible, introduction to Catholic theology, uh, and is a, is a source of great enjoyment for our students and for her colleagues as well. So after Sister finishes her talk, I'll take the microphone and I'll handle the question and answer session. Uh, but at this moment, I'd like to introduce to you and welcome Sister Jacinta Krejcik. Thank you. Good afternoon and thank you for coming. As Dr. Ritchie mentioned, um, this past Thursday, October 11th, uh, Catholics around the world celebrated the beginning of the Year of Faith which coincides with the 50th anniversary of the opening of the Second Vatican Council. Catholics are encouraged to pray the Apostles' Creed daily and delve into a deeper understanding of our faith. At the same time, many are revisiting what took place at and through this historic council. Recently, one Vatican II expert described this council as a tsunami of the spirit. Personally, I'm venturing into new territory with this talk. Being no expert on this topic, I simply enjoy reading the documents of Vatican II and find them quite inspirational. I am currently learning more about the history of this event since I was too young at the time of the Council to appreciate what was happening. I do not remember the use of Latin and the change to English in the liturgy but I do recall some of the other changes, like the removal of the communion rail at my family's parish church and receiving communion standing and in the hand. However, I'm not as drawn toward changes in the church building as I am toward exploring the deeper understanding of church itself. The church understanding itself, particularly as the people of God. This is a title that we find in the second chapter of the Dogmatic Constitution of the Church and will be my primary focus in this lecture. Let's explore a little background first. Throughout the 20th century, Catholic, Orthodox, and Protestant Christians had been studying the nature and structure of the church. Within Catholicism, papal encyclicals related to this prominent theme were increasing ever since the First Vatican Council. In preparation for the First Vatican Council, a draft declaration on the church had been prepared ahead of time. The council convened on December 8, 1869, but was interrupted by the Franco-Prussian War. Pope Pius IX suspended the council indefinitely on October 20th, 1870, with much of the work incomplete. Thus, when Pope John XXIII announced his intention to have a second ecumenical council, it was generally thought that the main focus would be the church. The dogmatic constitution on the church was the second document to be, to be produced at the council. It is one of the four major documents to be considered a constitution, 
and, of one, and one of two to be considered dogmatic. This means that it is one of the most authoritative documents and with De Verbum, the dogmatic constitution on divine revelation, it does not contain any new definitions of dogma, but it represents existing ones with a view to their application in the present day. Many recognize the dogmatic constitution of the church to be the most momentous achievement of the council, both because of its important contents and because of its central place among the council documents. In preparation for the Second Vatican Council, which opened October 11, 1962, a theological commission had prepared a first draft or schema in advance, which was then presented to the council on December 1st at the end of the first session. Cardinal Avery Dulles related, among the documents of Vatican II, probably none underwent more drastic revision between the first schema and the final, finally approved text. When the council fathers came together, they immediately saw the need of setting forth a radically different vision of the church, more biblical, more historical, more vital and dynamic. An entirely new document was therefore drafted during the interval between the first and second sessions. As noted here, during the interval was the death of beloved Pope John the 23rd on June 3rd, 1963, and the election of a new Pope, Paul VI, on June 21st. Work continued during the second and third sessions of the council. Within two months into the third session, the document was completed and ready for vote. It passed overwhelmingly, 2,151 to five on November 19th and was promulgated by Pope Paul VI on November 21st as the third session of the council closed. The dogmatic constitution on the church consists of eight chapters. Some of these chapters expand our vision, giving us a large overall perspective and set the tone. The mystery of the church on the people of God, the universal call to holiness in the church, and the eschatological nature of the pilgrim church and its union with the church in heaven. Three other chapters focus in on the particular mission that God calls each person to carry out according to his or her vocation. There's a chapter about the clergy called on the hierarchical structure of the church and in particular on the episcopate, which addresses the roles of bishops, priests, and deacons. Included in this was the decision to reinstate the permanent diaconate and allow it to be open to married men. This chapter especially addresses the issues of collegiality among the bishops, which they were experiencing firsthand during the council. There is a chapter that focuses on the laity, which I will speak about later, and a chapter about those called by God to religious life. The document concludes with a chapter on the role of the Blessed Virgin Mary under her title, Mother of God, being the mother of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As an effective summary, it reconnects us with the first chapter on the mystery of the church, which Pope John had expressed is the loving mother of all, spreading everywhere the fullness of Christian charity. The dogmatic constitution on the church states its aim in the first paragraph. Since the church is in Christ like a sacrament or as a sign and instrument, both of a very closely knit union with God and of the unity of the whole human race, it desires now to unfold more fully to the faithful of the church and to the whole world its own inner nature and universal mission. However, I think it is important to look at the opening line. 
As you may know, Catholics have a tendency to name writings and prayers after their opening words, such as calling the Lord's Prayer the Our Father. Likewise, this document is referred to as Lumen Gentium, Latin for Light of Nations, taken from its opening words, Christ is the Light of Nations. Although the document is about the church, the main focus is Jesus Christ, and rightly so, because the church would not exist without Christ. Cardinal Ratzinger, now Pope, Pope Benedict XVI, explains it this way. The Second Vatican Council clearly wanted to speak of the church within the discourse on God, to subordinate the discourse on the church to the discourse on God, and to offer an ecclesiology that would be theological in a true sense. Consequently, Lumen Gentium begins with a beautiful chapter that is Trinitarian, and with use of scripture and quotes from the early church fathers, it focuses on God's plan to raise humanity to a participation in the supernatural divine life of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In this opening chapter, I find the Council Fathers expressing what earlier Franciscan theologians have emphasized, that long before the fall of humanity into sin and the need for a Redeemer, the Heavenly Father had planned before the foundation of the world that in His Son we humans were chosen to be adopted children of God. The Son of God came then to inaugurate the kingdom of heaven on earth and to reveal to us the mystery of that kingdom. God's kingdom is present on earth and growing through the, through the church as Lumen Gentium describes. Already from the beginning of the world, the foreshadowing of the church took place. It was prepared in a remarkable way through the history of the people of Israel by means of the Old Covenant. In the present era of time, the church was constituted and by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit was made manifest. At the end of time, it will gloriously achieve completion when, as we read in the Fathers, all the just from Adam and from Abel the just one to the last of the elect will be gathered together with the Father in the universal church. Lumen Gentium makes it clear that all people are called to this union with Christ, who is the light of the world, and that the church, endowed with Christ's gifts and the spirit of charity, humility, and self-sacrifice, has the mission to spread the kingdom of God to all people. The document then provides a descriptive understanding of the nature of the church by using various metaphors, many of them rooted in the Hebrew images of the Old Testament. For instance, the church is a sheepfold whose one and indispensable door is Christ. It is a flock of which God himself foretold he would be the shepherd. Further in this section, the church is described as the mystical body of Christ. Here we see teachings that come to us from the letters of St. Paul. The Holy Spirit draws individuals into members of the body, united with Christ the head, who pours his life into the believers through the sacrament of baptism and continually nourishes his members with himself in the Eucharist that they may be formed into his own likeness. Each member is given gifts or charisms to be used in loving service for the good of the whole, to build up the church in unity and in union with Christ its head. Here it is explained that just as Christ has two natures, divine and human, the body of Christ is both human and divine. In other words, the church is at one and the same time an earthly structured organization and the mystical body of Christ. 
It is a visible assembly and a spiritual community. It is always in need of purification and renewal, and yet it is holy. Because the church is human, it exists in time and is subject to the forces of history. It endures sorrows and challenges, both within itself and from without, sharing in the cross of Christ. And yet, because of its divine element, it presses forward, full of optimism, toward a goal beyond history, rejoicing in the strength and power of the risen Lord to proclaim Christ until he comes again in glory. Throughout this constitution, the mystery of the church is viewed in terms of the paradoxical union between the human and the divine. Among the various images used to describe the church, the main one found in Lumen Gentium is people of God, the focus of chapter two. People of God indicates that God desires to bring individuals together as one. God draws each person toward holiness and salvation through our relationship with one another. This assembly is meant to be a reflection of the perfect community that is the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, which is both diversity and unity at once. Again, the council points out that this term, people of God, is not new. It is rooted in the Old Testament. God called the chosen people of Israel to be in a covenant relationship, to be his own people who he formed in holiness. However, in God's ultimate plan, the Old Testament covenants were a preparation and prefiguring of what was to come. The prophet Jeremiah proclaimed, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. This new covenant was instituted by Christ as he called together a people made up of Jew and Gentile making them one, not according to the flesh, but in the spirit. This was to be the new people of God. Christ is the head of this new people of God, who he redeemed by his blood, and who are reborn through water and the Holy Spirit. Established by Christ as a communion of life, charity, and truth, it is also used by him as an instrument for the redemption of all, and is sent forth into the whole world as the light of the world and the salt of the earth. Jesus gave the great commission, saying, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. When a child is baptized and becomes a member of the people of God, during the anointing with oil that follows, this prayer is prayed. The God of power and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ has freed you from sin and brought you to new life through water and the Holy Spirit. He now anoints you with the chrism of salvation so that, united with his people, you may remain forever a member of Christ, who is priest, prophet, and king. We may ask, what does this mean, that Christ is priest, prophet, and king? Why is this a part of one's baptism? In the Old Testament, we see that Israel's priests, prophets, and kings were anointed with oil in preparation for their particular work. For example, the prophet Samuel was told by God to anoint Jesse's youngest son, David, who would be the next king of Israel. We are told in the first book of Samuel, then Samuel, with 
the oil in hand, anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David. With this history of priests, prophets, and kings being anointed for service among God's chosen people, Israel believed that when the promised Messiah arrived, he would be priest, prophet, and king in one person. This person, from among their own, would be Messiah, which means anointed one, or Christ in Greek. Thus we see Jesus in the synagogue at Nazareth proclaiming, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. The, Holy, the, the New Testament scriptures show us in various ways how Jesus fulfilled these three offices or roles of priest, prophet, and king. Likewise, Christians are anointed by the Holy Spirit in baptism to share in these three offices of Christ and to bear responsibility for the mission and service flowing from them. Lumen Gentium walks us through each one of these three offices and helps us understand how to live them out. First of all, like Christ the High Priest, we are to offer spiritual sacrifices to God, proclaiming God's power and persevering in prayer and praise. Sharing fully in the priesthood of Christ means receiving the sacraments and joining in the offering of the Eucharist, presenting oneself as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, and going forth to bear witness to Christ through self-denial and active charity. In this section, each of the seven sacraments is addressed as a powerful means of salvation and a fortification for growth in holiness. While the document differentiates between the common priesthood and the ministerial priesthood, it emphasizes that all the baptized share in the priesthood of Christ. Secondly, the people of God share in Christ's prophetic office. A prophet listens to God and shares God's word through teaching and counsel, whether formal, formally or informally. This involves striving to understand the truths of the faith more fully and to give witness to God through words and deeds. The letter of Jude states, Contend for the faith that was once for all handed down to the holy ones. Build yourselves up in your most holy faith. In this section of Lumen Gentium, the council states, the entire body of the faithful, anointed as they are by the Holy One, cannot err in matters of belief. They manifest this special property by means of the whole people's supernatural discernment in matters of faith, when, from the bishops down to the last of the lay faithful, they show universal agreement in matters of faith and morals. That discernment in matters of faith is aroused and su sustained by the spirit of truth. It is exercised under the guidance and the, of the sacred teaching authority in faithful and respectful obedience to which the people of God accepts that which is not just the word of men, but truly the word of God. Through it, the people of God adheres unwaveringly to the faith given once and for all to the saints, penetrates it more deeply with right thinking and applies it more fully to its life. Thirdly, to share in Jesus' kingship means to offer humble service as he did, especially to give care to those who are poor and suffering. Through the Gospels, it is clear that Jesus came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Participating in, G in Christ's kingly mission also requires doing our part to contribute to the good of the whole, furthering the kingdom of God by promoting unity and peace. The Holy Spirit provides gifts or charisms to all of the faithful, which are meant to be used as God wills, 
to contribute toward the renewal and building up of the church. Between all the parts of the church, there remains a bond of close communion, whereby they share spiritual riches, apostolic workers, and temporal resources. For the members of the people of God are called to share these goods in common. While the second chapter of Lumen Gentium describes how the whole church shares in these three offices of Christ, two further chapters, chapter 3 and chapter 4, describe more fully how the hierarchy and the laity share in the priestly, prophetical, and kingly functions of Christ. The Council, in devoting a chapter specifically to the laity, makes it clear that their full and active participation is necessary for the life of the church and the good of the world. For example, baptized into Christ's priestly office, the laity, dedicated to Christ and anointed by the Holy Spirit, are marvelously called and wonderfully prepared so that ever more abundant fruits of the Spirit may be produced in them. For all their works, prayers, and apostolic endeavors, their ordinary married and family life, their daily occupations, their physical and mental relaxation, if carried out in the Spirit, and even the hardships of life, if patiently borne, all these become spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Together with the offering of the Lord's body, they are most fittingly offered in the celebration of the Eucharist. Thus, as those everywhere who adore in holy activity, the laity consecrate the world itself to God. Lumen Gentium makes it clear that Jesus came for everyone and all people are called by God to be a part of the people of God, living in universal peace and unity. To understand what it means to be a part of the people of God, the church, we must return to a section toward the end of chapter 1, which connects with the last four sections in chapter 2. This middle paragraph of section 8 in chapter 1 seems to be the most disputed portion of Lumen Gentium. It reads, This is the one church of Christ, which, is the creed, which in the creed is professed as one holy, Catholic, and apostolic, which our Savior, after his resurrection, commissioned Peter to shepherd, and him, and the other apostles to extend and direct with authority, which he erected for all ages as the pillar and mainstay of the truth. This church, constituted and organized in the world as a society, subsists in the Catholic Church, which is governed by the successor of Peter and by the bishops in communion with him. Although many elements of sanctification and of, and of truth are found outside of its visible structure. These elements, as gifts belonging to the Church of Christ, are forces impelling toward Catholic unity. Much has been written in regard to these three sentences, with particular focus on the, on the idea that the one Church of Christ subsists in the Catholic Church. What does this mean? Is the Catholic Church saying we are better than others? Is this a blow to ecumenical efforts toward Christian unity? Various scholars have pointed out that it's important to understand the meaning of the words being used here. The Council spent plenty of time discussing and working through this wording. The first schema had said that the Church of Christ is the Catholic Church, using the Latin word est. The next draft replaced est with adestin, which means is present in. Finally, the, the decision was made to use subsisted in, meaning subsists in. This choice, appearing in the final document, seems to be a moderate expression that on the one hand isn't totally exclusive 
and, on the other hand, doesn't water down the church's self-understanding. This choice of wording was explained by Cardinal Ratzinger about five years before he became Pope in this way. The word subsistit derives from the ancient philosophy as it was later developed among the scholastics. It corresponds to the Greek word hypostasis, which of course plays a key role in Christology in describing the union of divine and human natures in the one person of Christ. Subsistere is a special case of essay. It refers to existence or being in the form of an individual subject. With the word subsistit, the council wanted to tell us that the church of Jesus Christ as a concrete subject in this world can be found in the Catholic Church. This can take place only once, and the idea that the subsistit could be multiplied fails to grasp precisely the notion that is being intended. With the word subsistit, the council wished to explain the unicity of the Catholic Church and the fact of her inability to be multiplied. The church exists as a subject in historical reality. The difference between subsistit and est, however, contains the tragedy of ecclesial division. Although the church is only one and subsists in a unique subject, there are also ecclesial realities beyond this subject, true local churches and different ecclesial communities. Continuing with this quote from Lumen Gentium, we see many elements of sanctification and of truth are found outside the Catholic Church's visible structure. These elements, as gifts belonging to the, to the Church of Christ, are forces impelling toward Catholic unity. The late Father Richard Newhouse took this to mean that if one is in a living relationship with Christ, one is also in relationship with his church, for body and head cannot be separated. Therefore, communities of faith outside the Catholic Church are ecclesial communities. And therefore, Lumen Gentium says that non-Catholics who are baptized and believe in Christ are in a certain but imperfect communion with the Catholic Church. The goal of ecumenism is not to create a unity that does not exist, but to bring to fulfillment the very real unity that is already there between Catholics and non-Catholics who are brothers and sisters in Christ. Here we might clarify the, that, that Vatican II's use of the term ecclesial communities refers to Protestant congregations, and particular churches refers to Orthodox congregations who are in closer communion with the Catholic Church. Through these statements, the Council is countering any suggestion that the Catholic Church is only one church among other churches. And it is underscoring that the Catholic Church is nothing less than the Church of Christ. As such, it is called to be faithful to be as faithful as possible to what Christ intended his church to be. At the same time, it repeatedly emphasizes that this has nothing to do with boasting or rivalry. Lumen Gentium, Lumen Gentium makes it clear that everything the Catholic Church has received is a gift from God, which carries a responsibility with it. If a Catholic does not persevere in charity, active love towards one's neighbor, he or she will not be saved. Christ has poured out tremendous graces upon his church, and if we fail to respond to those graces in thought, word, and deed, not only will we not be saved, but we will be the more severely judged. At the same time, Catholics must recognize that although there is ecclesial division, Thankfully, the Lord has gifted these communities of brothers and sisters in Christ 
with many elements of sanctification and of truth. Lumen Gentium highlights that the Catholic Church knows that for many reasons she is joined to these communities in a certain real communion of union in the, of unity in the Holy Spirit. Since Christ came for all people as the light of nations and wills that all be saved, Lumen Gentium goes on to speak of the relationship of the church with the Jews who remain the most dear to God and with Muslims who along with us adore the one and merciful God. Furthermore, there are those who in shadows and images seek the unknown God who gives life and breath to all. Those who, moved by grace, strive by their deeds to do God's will as it is known to them through the dictates of conscience. They also can attain to salvation who, through no fault of their own, do not know the gospel of Christ or his church. Nor does divine providence deny the helps necessary for salvation to those who without blame on their part have not yet arrived at, a, at an explicit knowledge of God and with his grace strive to live a good life. Whatever good or truth is found amongst them is looked upon by the church as a preparation for the gospel. It is Christ who gives this goodness and truth so that they may finally have life. In these last paragraphs about the people of God, Lumen Gentium makes it clear that all disciples of Christ are called to share the faith. In our world where some people are despairing and others are deceived by the evil one to believe lies, the church must reach out to them with the light of Christ. We are called to be missionary, spreading the gospel through evangelization and works of charity all empowered by the Eucharist, the source and summit of the Christian life. In this way, the church both prays and labors in order that the entire world may become the people of God, the body of the Lord, and the temple of the Holy Spirit, and that in Christ, the head of all, all honor and glory may be rendered to the Creator and Father of the universe. In conclusion, I would agree with Father Orsi that yes, Vatican II was a tsunami of the Spirit. As the Council Fathers, along with their theological experts, had this special time dedicated to discussion, study, and prayer, their own spiritual lives deepened. Their clearer vision is expressed in the documents they produce, writings which convey a tone very different from any previous council. They express a vision that is inviting and inspiring, courageous and challenging, calling us to renewal and conversion of heart through deep prayer and faithful action. In Lumen Gentium, we see an image of a loving God who calls us his people. I would like to leave you with a reflection on the people of God which comes from the book Vatican II in plain English. The church is constantly moving and searching, wandering, not unlike the Hebrew experience in the desert. And even though the church's movement is sometimes filled with trial and tribulation, nonetheless, it remains faithful overall. It continues to be a visible sign of unity a sacrament of salvation for all people, aware of the absolute importance of its mission, the church seeks constant renewal. It never ceases to beg the Holy Spirit for the grace it needs to be the light of the world, Lumen Gentium. Thank you. With Lumen Gentium's affirmation of the universal call to holiness that all Christians have, 
how that challenges vowed religious to think about their own special vocation within the church. If they're not the professionals and we're the amateurs, what, how does this challenge you to reconceive uh, and renew what it means to be a vowed Franciscan sister? Okay, good question. Um, the, the chapter um, on religious life in Lumen Gentium uh, focuses especially on the vows um, and um, living out the vows, um, you know, continually being renewed in our vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience, <clears throat> and um, how to live those out, you know, each day, you know, in the present time. And um, oh, there was something else I read about it too. Um, it, it was something about um, the um, how it's not seen as um, like like a, a state of life that's um, you know falling between clergy and laity and you know like there's this order. It it brings out that there's a wholeness. There's every all of the people of God are, you know, baptized. And so it's like it, um, it, it shows this equality and, and then, um, but how, um, the calling to religious life comes out of, um, our baptismal call, um, and then it goes on to say, um, um, some then in the baptismal call are called to, um, to religious, religious life. Some are called to live that out as um, members of the, of the clergy. Um, or like it mentions in the, in the chapter, um, bishops, priests, and deacons. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. But I was uh, while you were talking, I was thinking of of uh, the basilica in Washington D.C. and mm -hmm. uh, one new piece of art was put in there called the Universal Call of mm -hmm. uh, Holiness, yes. and that so very much impressed me. Mm -hmm. And I, I all so your little idea that uh, it's it's for everyone, you know. Uh, and and your expo explanation of people, uh, you know, outside other denominations, that call this for them and for everyone, and that sort of uh, mm -hmm. that kind of diversity is there, but also the unity. Besides the fact in in that church there is so much diversity, all the different kinds of Mary devotions to Mary and that sort of thing is beautiful. But that. I just wanted to say that universal call for holiness for the people of God has got to be the most important thing that I've mm -hmm. noticed. I think maybe what could be shared, um, for those of you who might not be familiar with um, like the church before Vatican II and, and then after Vatican II, and of course I was too young to know <laughs> before Vatican II, but I've heard plenty. Um, that Catholics were to keep to themselves a lot and, you know, not go share worship and prayer with other Christians. And Vatican II broke that open. And, you know, to see that we're, we're, body, we're brothers and sisters in Christ. You spoke about um, a difference in tone that distinguishes Lumen Gentium from its, its predecessors. Yes. Um, would you say more about that difference in tone and also if there's an important difference in substance as well as tone? Um, the tone definitely is different and, and I think that um, surprised the bishops as they were working on it because um, they, they knew from the history that um, in the different uh, councils, um, 
the church the the church leaders had come together uh, to um, a lot of times because of heretical movements, you know, and to to clarify that well, what's what's being believed over here is. Uh, to be condemned, you know, this is this is to be condemned over here, and no, this is where we stay is with the truth over here, that, you know, that Christ handed on, and so the the tone of um, previous councils um, expressed a lot of of uh, more authority um, and um, condemnation. Um, whereas this is definitely pastoral. Vatican II was very pastoral. I'm curious whether e either Vatican I or II came about as a result of an upwelling of sentiment among the bishops, or was it the Pope's idea? Of, so oh. many councils have arisen out of the insistence of bishops at the bishops. Be a council. Yes, yes. Um, yes. I, here I'd refer to what um, Dr. Comfer spoke about last month, um, and that um, also what I've read on it some is that um, when Pope John the 23rd um, became Pope, um, he was getting word from from bishops, from others in the church and outside of the church that, you know, there are so many questions, there are so many needs, there are so many problems. And how do we deal with the changing situation in the world um, at this time, you know? Um, and, you know, we need to, to have some kind of updating in a way to be more, more relevant. And um, uh, w would you like to add some? No, I was gonna ask another question. Oh, okay. <laughs> I but but I, I think that historically that did happen with this council, uh, that it was seen as a way to bring many, many voices together um, and, and to express the church in a, in a much more universal way, dealing with some of the, the lived issues of the church. Mm -hmm. And, um, no one thought that this elderly pope would do much, but he surprised everyone and just said, let's open the, <laughs> open the doors and let the spirit come in more fully. I, I, I wanna thank you, especially for going over uh, much of the, the, the chapter and the people of God and pointing out that the, th the threefold row, I, I think we, we, we've become so used to those terms of a priest and prophets and king mm -hmm. uh, that, that, are, that are gifts and charisms that we all have by way of baptism. We forget that that came out of this council. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's so saturated our, our own speech. I remember reading in Ut Unum Sint, which John Paul II wrote, um, I think almost 30 years after the council. And he, he begins a, a kind of an argument that uh, the, the issue that he wants to address is triggered in his mind by the witness, the, the prophetic role, the witness that he finds in the martyrdom of so many Christians who are not in union with Rome. Mm -hmm. That it's forcing him to recognize the spirit is working in those ecclesial communities and he yes. must address uh, Rome's lack of energy to, to, to help bring that unity to fruition. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that, yeah. that reminder of that. You're welcome. Another thing that I, um, that I like about the, the um, idea of priest, prophet, and king um, was a reflection that I came across um, back in 2005 when I, I took a group of um, young adults to um, World Youth Day in Cologne, Germany. And there in, in the uh, cathedral there, um, it's supposedly the relics of uh, the, um, the three magi, <laughs> the three kings um, you know, that we celebrate uh, Christmas, Epiphany, 
um, who brought the three gifts to Jesus, the newborn infant, and um, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And there are reflections on how these three gifts relate to these three offices. Um, gold presented to Christ because he's a king. Um, incense, which was used by, used by priests in worship, you know, given to Christ because he's high priest. And um, myrrh, a very unusual gift to give to a newborn infant because it was used to embalm the dead, um, represents his uh, prophetic role because the prophets usually die. They are usually martyred, like you said. Are there any other questions? Well, I'd like to thank you once again, Sister, for a, a wonderful and a stimulating talk. Uh, I noticed Sister Felicity is here, too. When I called you the, holy, the holiest in the department, let me say, like the presidential <laughs> election, polls are all over the place, and it's a horse race. So uh, I don't want to make right. it. This is no time to be making enemies, as Oscar no. Wilde said. So, well, I'd like to thank everyone for coming. We have another talk, uh, November 11th. I'll be speaking on the inspiration of Scripture in Dei Verbum. Uh, trying to bring out in the same way that Lumen Gentium discusses the presence of God in the church, I'll be discussing what Vatican II has to say about the Word of God in Scripture and how in the modern world we try and hear God's voice through the, through the Bible. So I hope I'll see you on November 11th, same time, same place, and God bless. Thank you. Thank you for coming, and there are um, some refreshments out here, I know. Uh, Sister Anita's cookies and some water. Thank you for coming. Thank you.